welcome to part three of our unequivocally gripping whiskey mentary on the sourcing on the Whiskey Tangent Podcast. I'm Scott. And I am Ed. Last time in part two, we discussed MGP and the other distillers who have been and continue to be the fountains from which have sprung much of the whiskey consumed in recent years, as well as some of the reasons sourcing has garnered a bit of a bad reputation. Uh-huh. But today, in our final installment, we'll talk about how we can erase the sourcing stigma as we shift the spotlight from the sourcers to the sourcees, mm. the companies, brands, and even local liquor stores that are the recipients of all this great sourced whiskey. And Ed's going to start us off in that vein by giving us an overview of who's sourcing what and how they're pushing the industry in new and exciting directions. Right. I mean, we've listed quite a few on here that have sourced their whiskey from other distilleries, Yeah, whether it be George Dickel or Heaven Hill Mm -hmm. or, of course, MGP, um, Angel Envy Rye, a favorite whiskey among the Whiskey Tangent podcast. Never heard of it. Whatever. Um, <laughs> we've had an amazing experience with Barrelcraft Spirits. Mm. They source from MGP. Mm-hmm. Some fun ones I've never tried. Big ass bourbon and big bottom bourbon. Ooh. Oh my God. Becky, look at her butt. Both of those fun named bourbon source from MGP. Of course, Bullet Rye. Mm-hmm. Some local ones like a Coney Island. Mm. Carlo Bourbon. <laughs> Sounds fun. Carlo. Carlo Bourbon. <laughs> Henderson Rye, Pritchard's Rye. Uh, yep. I've seen Rebel Yell Rye is oh, out yeah. there. Sagamore Spirit Rye in Maryland is a company that is aging their own spirit right now. Right. Was, and in the meantime, they're out sourcing through MGP. Yeah, and, one of the many, many companies yeah, we've that are enjoyed doing that. that. Their Double Oak is good. Oh, their yeah. Cognac finished is amazing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Sagamore has done some great stuff. Yeah. The Tin Cup, W.H. Harrison, Whistle Pig Old World Rye, and surprisingly to many people, Will It Rye. Really? Will It Rye has what they call Indiana Rise, I guess. That's where oh. they get it from. You can live deeper and deeper. And one of them, we're sipping on now a product called Old Scout Street mm. Bourbon from the people over at Smooth Ambler. And we're going to talk about how their coming up and putting their own out but this is an mgb product so they're doing both they have their own stuff and they're continuing to source right so for example their their old scout line as well as another one their contradiction which is a blend of their house made distillate and sourced distillate they say contradiction is the best of both worlds and it gives them options to really play with the flavor Mm -hmm. however what they said was sourcing was just supposed to be a bridge for them but they've done so well with their old scout and their other products that they have no plans to discontinue it or change it. Uh, interesting. So it's a high rye bourbon and it's normally five years old and bottled at 99 proof. Now we have a barrel pick from Banach that's 115 proof. It, it really hits. But it's really, <laughs> really super good. And we're yeah. drinking it in honor of MGP and sourcing. Yes. Because we wanted to have something to sip on while we got started. So, mm-hmm. and actually, I'd never drank old scout before. It's the first time I've ever had it. You know, I had it years ago it was when i was just trying different things and i didn't know anything about what i was doing and you know i remember liking it quite a bit it wasn't this proof it was the one you described before right yeah yeah. um but i remember liking it although i never got it again so i don't know maybe i didn't but i might might have to try the contradiction i've seen that a lot that's the one with the elephant yes it's like on top of a ball or something yeah Yeah. like some poor circus elephant (laughs) right right standing on a is it on a ball or it's uh, on a barrel? Oh, it's on a ba- Oh, well, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. It makes a lot more sense. Yeah. Since uh, we were speaking to Banash today, I, while I was there picking up the weeder, I grabbed this as well. Yeah, yeah. We'll be talking to one of the owners of Banash Liquors uh, about the weeder and how they source and, uh, you know, the whole consumer side of what we did last time when we talked to MGP and how they do it from their side. Right. And a couple other that started out sourcing that are now doing both or moving away from it. High West Distillery. Right. Their double rye used to be two ryes that they source. Now one of the ryes is their own. Yeah, I think they did that with their um, Midwinter and Night's Dram. Right, and some they've changed up. For example, High West Juice is pot distilled and younger, replacing some of the older stock that was column distilled. Mm. And since the column still whiskeys age for a long time to develop the heavier character, mm-hmm. they can replace with their own younger, but it's very full and heavy bottled pot still whiskeys kind of achieve the same finished product. Because yeah. Of the, even though it's younger, somehow it still retains the character. Yeah, because the column still, it's distilling it over and over and over mm-hmm. and over again. So it can weed out some of that complexity that a pot still will leave in. Right. And for Whistle Pig, we know they've been working hard to get their field to bottle process done. Their farm stock rye, crop number two, for example, incorporates a component of two year old whiskey distilled from the farm's grain. That release inches closer to the goal, trying to 
produce more and more of its own whiskey. Mm-hmm. And last, Bell Mead from the um, Nelson's Green Briar Distillery. Even though last summer the distillery released their own self distilled whiskey called First 108. However, Bell Mead, they said you can bet it's sticking around as a separate offering. It's better than we expected, and we'd be dumb to get rid of it. Again, another one. Right. Yeah. It's like once you have a successful product, you don't want to ruin it by replacing it with your own stuff because your own stuff is likely going to taste different than what you can get, what you have been getting, and what people already been enjoying and expecting. You almost can't if you have a successful product. Right. And they've been very transparent about their sourcing. And if you listen to the earlier parts, that's part of eliminating the problem. Right. I mean, being transparent is the key to taking away the stigma of sourcing. Exactly. So um, what I was saying last time in part two, I had placed part of the blame of sourcing's bad reputation on a lack of transparency. Mm-hmm. And I teased that there was a solution. Right. And for me, it all comes down to labeling. Because while advertising whiskey is a big business, whiskey owes a lot to the point of sale marketing. We've talked about it before, that wall of whiskey, you're in the liquor store and you want to try something new, but the whiskey aisle is just bursting at the seams. So how does a particular company stand out from the crowd? Bottling and labeling are paramount for drawing in new customers. And this is where some producers, a few of which we talked about in part two, have gotten into trouble with misleading labeling practices. But you might wonder why they're allowed to get away with telling half-truths on their labels in the first place. There ought to be a law, goddammit, you might shout (laughs) as the liquor store staff quietly calls the police. (laughs) Well, there is a law, several in fact, but to fully understand why those laws aren't quite effective enough, first you need to be introduced to the TTB. Mm. In 2002, the Homeland Security Act split the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, the ATF, into two new organizations. ATF's law enforcement arm was placed under the direction of the Justice Department, and ATF's regulatory arm was renamed and became the Tax and Trade Bureau, or simply TTB, which implements and enforces a broad range of provisions of the Federal Alcohol Administration Act, which requires that importers and bottlers of beverage alcohol obtain certificates of label approval prior to interstate commerce in order to ensure that products are labeled in accordance with federal laws and regulations. But what are those regulations? Well, it's too much to mention here, but basically they determine what every type of whiskey can be called based on its ingredients, how it was created, where it was created, and how it was aged. Everything from what gets to be called a quote-unquote whiskey to what gets to be called a bourbon, a rye, etc. When any of those can be called a straight whiskey, what happens when a whiskey is stored in used barrels instead of new barrels, when a whiskey must be called a blend, and even enforcing why a single malt made in America can't be called a scotch, or why an MGB product can't be called a Kentucky bourbon. Mm -hmm. And yet, even with all these very specific regulations, there are some loopholes. For example, regarding additives, the TTB allows 2.5% of quote-unquote harmless coloring or flavoring materials to whiskey but with no need to actually declare that on the label really yeah and regarding geographical locations you don't have to provide the name of the distillery or even the city just the state in which the spirit was distilled or bottled right i've seen some places put distilled in indiana on the wrapping yeah top of the of the nozzle Mm -hmm. so that when you crack it open that goes away right (laughs) as soon as you open the bottle there's no longer a record on the bottle that it was distilled in indiana right it's like really running down the side of the upper neck (laughs) It's so petty. It's so petty. (laughs) In addition, the TTB has seen waves of staff reductions over recent years. And when you couple that with the explosion of whiskey distilling and all the companies, brands, liquor stores, etc., who are buying and labeling their own spirits, the TTB sometimes simply lets things slip through that they shouldn't. And other times, brands will simply change the label after it's been approved because they know that the TTB simply doesn't have the resources to enforce the labeling after the fact. However, the TTB does actually purchase and test hundreds of bottles at random every year. And in 2016, 68 of the 175 brands that they tested were deemed to be in non-compliance for various reasons. That's almost 40%. Furthermore, if you're wondering why I highlighted 2016 information, well, as the TTB states on its website, starting with the 2017 sampling program, we will no longer report the results of our analysis on an annual basis. The program is being revised to include both random and risk-based samples so we can respond better to known issues. Hmm. So in other words, the organization meant to maintain transparency is now no longer transparent themselves. Hmm. So here are three solutions, I think, to this problem. Okay. One clarify the labeling regulations. Just one suggestion that I've seen on the internet that I think would clear up a lot of the confusion is simply state exactly where the whiskey was distilled, aged, and bottled, especially if it's sourced and or blended. So something like distilled and aged at name of distillery, 
city, state, mm. and bottled by name of company, city, state. Wow. Some whiskeys actually do this, but the fact that it's not required is a problem. Number two, just hire more staff at the TTB. <laughs> the alcohol business is a tax-generating machine providing the U.S. government with approximately 10 billion dollars annually so surely some of that money could be used to provide adequate enforcement of labeling and the third one i think and this was most important maybe vote with your wallet if there's a whiskey out there whose story or labeling or marketing you don't quite trust then just buy something else there are plenty of whiskey fish in the whiskey sea <laughs> most of whom are straightforward about where their whiskey comes from and what they do with it and be vocal about it on social media start a movement because if companies start losing revenue and a simple change to their label will fix it they're definitely going to make that change yeah i think that's that's all very true that's the way you fix it i think if you think i'm wrong you're wrong random belligerence <laughs> god that scared me <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it's such a big issue. I don't know. When you said, tell us the distillery, I'm like, for some reason I got uncomfortable with them. Like, maybe they don't want to admit that Heaven Hill makes their product. Maybe they're trying to have their own identity. Right, right? but I guess that's the whole thing is like, well, why don't they want to admit it? Well, yeah. If Heaven Hill is making this great whiskey right. and it's Heaven Hills, why doesn't Heaven Hill want you to know well, that? Because we want to be a cool whiskey company too. So it'd be like, if I'm trying to come up with my own kick-ass cola company and it finds out that Pepsi makes my colas, well, then we'll just go buy Pepsi, yeah. won't we? What do we think that maybe um, Bullet Bourbon might be made by... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, maybe Heaven Hill. So we're like, they have this great bourbon over at Bullet. Or I could just go to Heaven Hill and get Elijah Craig right, or so Evan I, Williams. Or, uh, right. So I understand why Bullet wouldn't want you to know, right. but why wouldn't Heaven Hill want you to know? You're asking Bullet to put Heaven Hill on their label. Yeah, that's, I get it. That's a very difficult thing for me to do if I'm Bullet. Right. If I want to say distilled in Kentucky, even if you want the city, like all right, Bardstown or whatever. So now everyone knows where mm -hmm. it is. But I didn't put my competitor's name. But so, like, so I get what you're saying, but that's from the corporate side. From yeah. the consumer side, though, the consumer right. says, well, I, I want to know, know that this. Yeah, I would love to know Heaven Hill. I yeah. would love to know. It would probably make me like that product more. But <laughs> it's definitely Buffalo Trace because, my God, if Buffalo Trace put anything out in the world for me to buy, oh, if God. they would source anything to anybody. So, oh, my God, this is actually a Buffalo Trace product that I'm drinking. Mm -hmm. It's so rare. Right. I think transparency is getting better. Yeah. Uh, we have two expressions that we're going to talk about today that mm -hmm. we have interviewed with right. the weeder. Um, actually says distilled in Lawrenceburg, Indiana, bottled by Jersey Artisan Distilling, Fairfield, New Jersey. So it's exactly what I just said. And we'll get to Lost Lantern later, right. who lists all of the distilleries that they source from on the front yeah, of their label. It's a great interview with a brand new distillery that's really trying to do some innovative and, and neat things. So first, we're going to talk to Billy from Banash. The third batch of their weeder came out, and he's going to kind of talk to the process. Not to mention that, they also do a lot of single barrel picks for Knob Creek. or Right, a different kind of sourcing. Right, when they go out and they sample barrels and pick one, and then that barrel is bottled and sold exclusively in their store, including the old Scout that we're drinking tonight, which right. is one of theirs. Indeed. So let's talk to Bill. All right. Hey, Bill. Hey, Bill. How's it going, guys? Bill, I want to thank you for coming on with us today to talk whiskey. How about just telling everybody like who you are, your background, you know, Benash and what you guys do? Yeah, um, I kind of grew up in the business. My dad and his two brothers bought the store in 1975. Through the years, um, it has changed hands. Rich came to the store in, in the mid 80s, and you know, you guys both know Rich. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I went to school for a while for chemical engineering, but always knew I would come back to the store. And about 12 years ago, came back full time. And maybe about seven, eight years ago, went to Scotland, started to get a lot more into whiskey. Um, at the time, it seemed like the in industry was you were doing a lot of like flavored vodkas and all that ridiculous stuff. And, <laughs> but, you know, you market to what's popular at the time. And that was popular at the time. But I'm glad that the whiskeys and more the craft thing has kind of come this way because that's what I've always been interested in. And I think our, the store kind of reflects that. I'm definitely a bourbon scotch type of person. I probably lean more towards scotch, quite honestly. But I enjoy all whiskey. Well, we have a lot to learn from you from scotch then because we are uh, <laughs> neophytes when it comes to scotch. But we are we are working on our palates. We actually have put ourselves through scotch boot camp the last year trying to uh, increase <laughs> our knowledge on palate because we know that that's the grandfather of whiskey and you can't really have a whiskey podcast and talk about whiskey if you don't have at least the essential understanding of scotch the six regions of scotland and the differences and luckily scott tends to be more open to pd in 
and smoky stuff. And I, I tend to like, I guess it's the space side and, and some of yeah. the sweeter scotches <laughs> and the blends. Yeah. yeah. So let's start off with your barrel picks. I know that your store puts out a lot of great barrel picks of existing brands. What's the process to have a Knob Creek or Four Roses or the one I got this week, Old Scout Barrel Pick from Panache? There's a lot of different um, ways you do the barrel picks. I would say the most common is to things like the Knob Creek, the Old Scout, where you get a kit. They'll send you three, five samples. Sometimes it's different. So say with the Knob Creek, they send three samples to you, but no one else is getting those three samples. You take your time, figure out the one you want, and then you pick it. Other ones, like this last one, they sent out 12 samples to us on a Saturday, but they send out those same 12 samples to like four or five other stores. So you kind of have to make up your mind quickly. And I mean, I've had it where it's like, oh, no, that one's already taken. And then it's like, all right, do I want to do the second one or, you know, wait for the next batch uh, to come in? Do you ever travel to Kentucky and distilleries? Have you ever gone down there and picked a barrel and had it sent up? Yeah, so um, I've done that twice now. So the first time was with Four Roses. So Four Roses has a pretty unique situation where you actually go, they pull it right from the barrel. And when we were down there, they have a total of 10 different recipes, but they don't tell you what the recipe is. So you just do everything blind. The only thing they tell you is when you get down to the last couple of barrels is, you know, what they expect it yield is of them. So like, if you're like, oh, I'm kind of tossed up between these final two, but the one I can get 150 bottles out of, the other one I can only get 110. But that was really the only thing, you know, they didn't tell you age, they didn't tell you recipe, they didn't tell you their opinion, you know, so that was a unique one. And then we did barrel down there where they were having a retail day. That was unique unto itself too. So they had about a total of 170 different barrels with every sample lined up. Um, mm. And they had about 30 or 40 retailers down there for this event from all across the country. And basically how it worked is anything that was out was available. And you could take up to two days to go around and taste as much as you wanted. But if someone at any point decides they want that barrel, that barrel's taken. It's theirs. Mm. So you kind of have that looking out the corner of your eye. Like, <laughs> uh, does anyone else feel like do they like that barrel, you know? It's like musical chairs. When the music stops, the barrel's gone. Yeah, we've done about five or six barrel, you know, craft spirit picks at this point. So every other one, they just come up with a bunch of samples. If there's anything you like, you know, it's yours. If not, don't worry about it. Right. So I know the third batch of the weeder came out this week and uh, you contract that with from MGP, correct? Well, secondarily, yes. It comes from MGP, but it comes from a distillery up in North Jersey, up in Fairfield. MGP ships it them and then they bottle it. But you, you... Right. you have to have a DSP license to actually buy a barrel. Right. Well, why don't you take through the process so basically the guy up there at uh, james fc hyde he got in touch with us probably about this time last year the only thing they actually make up there is their sorghum whiskey so anything else that they blend with or put out as a separate label they get from mgp so they realized there's a market for mgp juice and he just you know wanted to see if we were interested and i'm like yeah you know there's definitely a market for mgp stuff and he brought a few of the weed it bourbon samples which you really don't see too much of. I guess Redemption does the MGP Weed It bourbon. It's not a whole lot else that has a regular release, the MGP Weed It. Let's actually have Weeder number one right here. Very cherry, uh, Luxardo cherry notes in that to us, the one. Yeah, one stole my favorite of the three. I know. Oh my God, that's <laughs> what we said before you came on. <laughs> we really liked the second one, which was a uh, very vanilla forward. And we're actually tasting the third one right now, which uh, isn't vanilla or cherry, um, doesn't have a really dominant flavor, but we were thinking maybe that it's because it's a little bit more complex. It's like almost like a whipped cream, like kind of in your mouth type of a, of a creaminess, if you will. And so <laughs> incredibly smooth for 116 proof, like, oh my gosh, it goes right down. So what is the mash bill for the weeder? I know it's 45% wheat. And obviously it has to be at least 51% corn and they have to have some wounded barley in there to get the process going. So if I had to guess, I would say it was 51, 45, four. Okay. Uh, All right. That's exciting. Cause that's about as weeded bourbon as you can get, but it's delicious. The Sandy that you put out 115 proof rye expression was, I mean, it had great flavor to it. And I guess that was the 95, five from M. Yeah, that's 95, five. Yeah. So you don't really talk to MGP directly. The distillery is sort of a middleman between you and them, and they receive the barrels. And I, how do you get the labels? Do you create them or do you send them to them or do they create them? 
How does all that work? So we oh. signed the label. Yeah, they, they're the only ones who will do that for us that I know of. And, you know, because you do actually have to get taxation work, like national approval for those labels. Right. Yeah. The TTB. So uh, in doing research for this episode, I found it very interesting. And I was wondering how you submitted the labels. Did they come back at you? This is wrong. This is right. How long did that process take? So um, I don't know if I want to divulge any industry secrets about how he gets uh, his turnaround uh, so fast on his uh, labels. Absolutely. Okay. You, you don't you have don't to. Have to. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it, you know, the, both of our labels to get approved. I mean, we obviously were working, you know, trying to make a play off of Weller with the Weeder, WR, William and Rich. You know, that's right. our first two initials. And then when we did Sandy, we were kind of playing off of, you know, TH Handy for like a cash train for I. Oh, so, where's the L and the H come from? That's our metal initials. Oh. Uh, we're just Lionel and I'm Henry. My ex-wife's name is Sandy, so that's how much I love you guys that I would still buy that <laughs> and try <laughs> it. it. <laughs> to me, that, that had trouble written all over it for me. We also yeah. figured, you know, Sandy has the New Jersey. Right, the, well, yeah, the hurricane. The right, right, right. right. That's, that's what I thought you were going for. That's what I thought you were going for, yeah. So, Billy, uh, one last question for you. What's next up for Benash? What do you got cooking? Well, should be getting a Four Roses barrel in in the next couple of weeks. Um, we should be getting Elijah Craig barrel. Ooh. Um, which I don't know if we take you on that. That was that was actually a fun one, you know, talking about picking barrels. The Heaven Hell rep for the area came in with it. Didn't say anything, just pulled out four samples. And with this one, it was just like, wow, like this one, it's just like completely pops. It completely stands wow. out from all the other ones. Then he told us after we picked it, he's like, I didn't want to tell you this ahead of time, but it's Wreck House EE. Like that was Parker's favorite rec house. That's where usually Parker's heritage all comes from. Oh. So he didn't want to bias us beforehand. <laughs> you felt you felt validated then that you picked the best one in the batch. Honestly, Heaven Hill is one of our favorite distilleries. I actually have to think we Scott and I talk about it all the time just because we're whiskey geeks. The Heavy McKenna, the Pikesville, and the Elijah Craig, and 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 they have the best bottom shelf whiskey in the industry. Man, they're they're regular mm-hmm. McKenna, they're White Label, yeah, corn. Heaven Hill, Black Label, oh Great bottle. Yeah, that and the probably the Wild Turkey One Hundred One is probably the best bang for your buck in whiskey industry, in my opinion. Yeah. Twenty five bucks for that, but yeah. Well, listen, thanks so much for coming on. You have the best stuff in the area. You are the honey hole of South Jersey. Really thank you guys for doing what you do because, I mean, there's very few stores that cater to the whiskey connoisseurs like you guys do. And I, know I appreciate that. that. Thank I, you. I know that you love it as much as we do. And no matter how busy you are, you always take the time out to make each and every one of your customers feel like they're part of the Benash family. So, Billy, thanks so much. And uh, I'll see you for that Elijah Craig barrel. I know that. <laughs> All right. All right. See you guys. Thanks. Thanks, Billy. Well, that was great. So nice for Billy to come on and, and do that for us. And see, I didn't know that you didn't have to go right to MGP. Right. That basically, that means that in New Jersey, there's this distillery that's acting. It's kind of almost like a middleman or a wholesaler. Mm-hmm. They're getting samples from MGP, and then they're going to people uh, merchant side mm-hmm. and say, hey, you guys want a barrel? Here's your choices. And he picks one, and then they send it off to MGP, and then MGP sends the barrel to Jersey Artisan. They bottle it. Benash slaps on their labels, and mm-hmm. of course, have to be approved by the TTP. Yeah, right. Right. So Benash sells them in the store. Right, because legally, just anybody can't receive a barrel of whiskey, but a distillery can, and that's why I guess they right. took that route. You got to be bonded. I mean, they're very clear about that. Yeah. Scott and I couldn't just get a, <laughs> a I don't know, two hundred gallons of whiskey to ship to us, which I don't know why. We could prop it up here in the kitchen smack a spout on it and just call it a day but yeah no we, we'd just be sitting under it with our mouths open and <laughs> twisting the spigot go, oh, 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 oh. Right. so <laughs> billy kind of showed us the retail side of it of having a liquor store but we also were fortunate enough to talk to the lost lantern people mm-hmm. about their journey into sourcing and starting their vermont based uh, distillery which was wide open i mean heck there's no good whiskey in vermont ha ha J- JK Whistlepig, send us bottles. <laughs> send us <laughs> bottles. <laughs> if you got an extra 15 or 18 year old laying around, we'd love to feature that for you. 15 year old, 18 year old whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> of course you say. Of course. Of course. <laughs> what, what the hell does he even, don't even say that? <laughs> um, so, sorry. So, do you want to go to them yeah. right now? All right. So, yeah, yeah. we're going to go to um, Adam and Nora. Adam and Nora. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hey, gang. How you doing? Good. I'm Scott. Hi. Hi. I'm Adam. This is Nora. Nice to meet you. Adam, Nora, Med. How are you? So nice to have you on. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Absolutely. 
what state you guys are in? We're in Vermont. Um, oh. but we, were, we lived in Brooklyn for a, a long time. To be fair, let's get some baseline that we can just use to let people know who you are. How long have you guys been in operation? Lost Lantern has existed for two years so far. Our first releases came out in October. We actually, for the first year of Lost Lantern's existence, we were on the road visiting distilleries all over the United States. So that was a really important part of setting up our business because we needed to get to know the distilleries and talk to them and get to know their processes because part of our job is singing the praises of the distilleries we work with. So we wanted to connect with them and really understand what makes them tick and what drives their whiskey and the flavors. So you went to all these distilleries. So in the vatted malt edition number one that we have, uh, you went to Balconies and Copper Works, Santa Fe Spirits, Triple Eight in Massachusetts, Westward in Oregon and Virginia Distillery in Virginia. So you went to all these distilleries and sampled their products? Yep. The the um, rule that we have that we decided early on is we will only ever buy whiskey from a distillery that we visited in person. Oh, okay. So every distillery we work with, we've been to. But yeah, that's why, part of why we spent eight months on the road, just to uh, really get out there and understand what they're doing, tell them what we're about, why we're doing it, rather than just like emailing them from afar because whiskeys are so regionally focused these days. There are some big names that everyone knows, but there are also some distilleries that are making really, really wonderful stuff that really only sell in their state or maybe a couple of other states. And there were a lot of distilleries that we'd only heard of and we had never tasted their whiskey. So going to those places, learning about the distilleries, getting recommendations from distillers of other distilleries that we may not have even heard of Mm -hmm. and going and visiting them. For us, it was also really important to understand the full landscape of American whiskey. So when we're saying this American batted malt, which includes single malts from all over the country, from some of the greatest producers, we actually think that it's a good representation of where American malt is right now. Right. We came in and we were already both in the industry in different ways. I was reviewing craft whiskeys for Whiskey Advocate. I was a senior whiskey specialist there. And Nora had worked for uh, a long time at uh, Astor Wine and Spirits in New York, you know, one of the best spirits retailers out there. So we had had some relationships and knew people, but that actually made us want even more to get out there and actually see firsthand. Our long-term plan is to have a facility, have a big, extensive, beautiful warehouse with all of our casks. But one of the fun things for us is on the road, when we said, hey, are you willing to sell us some casks? A lot of people said yes. So we realized we could put this together really quickly. So we actually, for the time being, we contract out with a bottler. Basically, we transfer all of the casts in bond, and then they handle all of the bottling for us. These first releases were done by Virginia Distillery Company. And Mm. then going forward, we will probably do something a little bit more local so we can have our hands on things. It goes to a distillery. All of the legal I's are dotted and T's are crossed so that we go through the same process as any distillery. We just don't do it ourselves. Right. Excellent. Um, So one thing I think that is going to be the key, what we want to learn from you is how do you go about sourcing with these Mm -hmm. companies? How do you have the conversation? How do you actually get the barrels that you want? And how do you get the right blend if you're putting more than one whiskey together? Just how the whole thing goes from you meeting them to you end up putting stuff in a bottle. So it varies a little bit between our single casks, the blends we're working on for the future, and this blend in particular, because this was super unique. But for most of our whiskeys, we set up a meeting, we go in when we're there, we talk to them about what we're doing. We usually like to meet with um, like the owner and the distiller or the blender, which often are the same person. Sometimes they're not. See the facility, see the still in the warehouse. We usually taste a few barrels on site, but not always because we also decided we never want to buy when we're in the room. I don't know about you guys, but we find when we're in a distillery, you're surrounded by like the romance of it and the smells and like suddenly everything is amazing and... um, (laughs) But then when you take some samples home and you taste through them, like say like six of them when you're in the room, you take them all home. And then there are like two that really stand out mm-hmm. after we tasted a bunch of times in the same environment where we always taste, which during COVID is our kitchen table. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's how I really hone in on it. We generally taste semi-blind like we know what distillery the whiskey comes from, uh, but we don't know which whiskey is which in them. There are sometimes a couple different styles. We both taste through everything together. And the rule for every cast that we buy is we both have to be a firm yes on it. If one of us is like kind of lukewarm on a cask and the other person's really excited about it, too bad. Then we're going to pass on it, okay. which is infuriating sometimes. <laughs> when, uh, <laughs> but we have pretty different palates. 
So we think that's a really good way to actually balance that out. I mean, we put the cast through the ringer. We taste different times of day, multiple flights in a row so that the cast that we're picking, there's consistency, especially for the single cast when they're going to be all by themselves. And we release those at cast strength. So they have to really sing and speak to many different palettes. So you walk into the distillery. What is your parameters you're looking for? Before you even taste it, what do you get them to bring you? The starting off point of any conversation is saying that we want to put their name on our bottle, that it's super important to us that we say where things come from and that we're transparent. And I think part of what we're offering is this whiskey nerd's perspective on making whiskey. So we tell them that and generally people are excited about that. Mm -hmm. And generally when we go in, we, we have a sense of what they make. We generally want something that is an introductory barrel. So if someone has never tasted whiskey from that distillery, what is a great way to, to get to know the distillery? And then mm -hmm. we do one cask that is off the beaten path. So something that even if you love this distillery, you probably won't have tasted a whiskey exactly like that. But it, it changes a lot. Uh, when we went to Iron Root Republic in Texas, we were going there to, to get bourbon and we got there and we tasted some bourbons. And Jonathan Licorice, who does a lot of the production, told us that uh, we weren't allowed to leave until we tasted some corn whiskey and that he thought we really, really need to try it. And we we're like, come on, man, we can't do a corn whiskey one of our first releases. We can't sell that. And uh, we tried it. Loved it, we it. Uh, yeah. we loved it. We bought it. And, and, and it sold out in uh, 20 minutes. Wow. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so... Thanks, yeah. Jonathan, for making <laughs> us try it. But that's part of the fun is like, we're not ever going to know the best thing that a distiller has in their warehouse. Like we want to go to them and ask them, like, what are you excited about that you don't quite know what you're going to do with? And you want to share with people in a slightly different way. So that's what we really look for. So is that where the name comes from? Lost Lantern? You're sort of shining a lantern on lost things that people don't know. Exactly. exactly. Our tagline is shining a light on the independent spirit. Oh, so exactly. Nice. I like it. Yeah. And you said that this is your first edition, right? Yeah. Number one. So do you not ever plan to get back to this particular flavor? Or you it's a good question. So um, just to, to lay down the baseline again, this is a blend of American single malts from six states, from Washington, Oregon, New Mexico, Texas, Virginia, and Massachusetts. Wow. It's exciting. Um, and uh, It's like your own infinity bottle. <laughs> Right. Uh, it's a blend of 12 barrels. But the way we put this together, we think has never been done before. As we were on the road talking to some of these single malt distillers, they thought what we were doing was really cool. And they're like, oh, I've always wanted to play with blending single malt from other places. Like, that's so cool. You get to do that. And after hearing that for the third time, the light bulb went off. And I was like, why don't I invite these people who know their own whiskeys really well and like our master blenders or incredibly experienced to come do this with us. So in Colorado last year, the blenders and distillers from all of these distilleries sat in local distillery, tasted through 35 something barrel samples that everyone picked out by hand and blended together. And that's how we picked the barrels for this blend. We didn't do edition number two this past spring like we intended to, but it should be an annual release and it'll be collaborative with the producers of the underlying whiskey. And that allows us to get our hands on barrels that we would probably never get otherwise. Yeah. Style wise for, for this release, yeah. we said we gave pretty loose guidance. We were like, Bring some barrels you're excited about that you think reflect where American single malt is right now. But in other years, we're going to do other guidance. Like we'll say, like, bring stuff that's uh, that's really smoky or bring stuff that's mostly in used casks or et cetera, et cetera. So the style will vary year to year. Right. We're not going for consistency. The idea is it's a snapshot of what American single malt producers are excited about in that year. Right. And once this is gone, it's, it's gone. Yeah. It's gone. Okay, it's just right. On to the next thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, well, unfortunately, we only have like three minutes left yeah, for the call. Uh, I was just going to wrap it up. Listen, if someone out there wants to get uh, Lost Lanterns whiskey, give them some information on right now and then maybe how you're going to be doing it. Yeah. So right now we work with two online retailers. The best place to get all of the information on where you in your particular state should buy the whiskey is just by going to lostlanternwhiskey.com. It's just online currently, but in the spring or summer of next year, our hope is to go into some bars and retailers, depending on really what the pandemic does, because we don't want to spend the time to put things into retailers if no one's going there. So that's kind of pending the pandemic and yeah. pending <laughs> vaccines and all of that. But the plan is to have some portion of it to go through normal distribution channels. Yeah. So. The whiskey bar that we go to uh, does only serve American whiskeys. 
Oh, cool. So um, we will definitely recommend this to our uh, Anders, our bartender there. That would be great. Yeah. All right. Well, we're less than a minute. <laughs> so. We were laughing because like we just never got around to buying a professional Zoom. We hardly ever needed to go over like 30 minutes. So right. but we just talked about this morning. Like, dude, we, let's just buy it. Like, we should arm. do it. We should do it. And then now, we're, oh my God, we're up against <laughs> now we have a minute, Now we have a minute left. But yeah. we really appreciate you getting on and we welcome you as friends of the podcast. And as you release something down the road, we know we can help bring that to the view as well. Awesome. We appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for your time and having yeah. us on. Yeah. Um, we'll come visit when we're uh, on the road again. Yes. Um, yeah. If you're, ever, if you're ever in Jersey, if you're ever in yeah. Jersey, yeah, we'll absolutely. take you out. We'll really show you a good time. And you can come see train wreck in Mount Holly, the good distillery. Perfect. Yeah. Right. That yep. sounds like the pan. All right. Thanks, Nora and Adam. All right. They were so nice to talk to. Oh my God. Just, so nice. And here we have, a, we're actually sipping on. Oh them. yeah. We have a little bit. Lost Lantern American vatted malt release. Number one. Um, it is a blend of American single malts, 12 barrels from six different distilleries. Balconies from Waco, Texas, uh, Copper Works from Seattle, Washington, Santa Fe Spirits from Santa Fe, New Mexico, Triple Eight from Nantucket, Massachusetts, Westward from Portland, Oregon, and Virginia Distillery Company from Lovingston, Virginia. Its mash bill, of course, is undisclosed because, God, how could you even calculate it? you figure it out? <laughs> the proof is 105. Uh, the age is two years. We do know that. Right. Two year might just be because that's the youngest... Yeah. So it might they might have some older stuff in there. I'm not sure. This was given to us. The, they reached out and uh, sent us some samples. Yeah. So we're going to taste it. So good. There is just the slightest like hint of smoke, smoke. in the end. It's yeah. so subtle. Just the way I like it. Because mm-hmm. I don't care for, as anyone who knows who listens to this for five minutes, I don't like, you know, terrible peaty smoky yeah. spirits but it's quite nice on the oh, nose because you're getting a just a, like you said just a really small hint of smoke yeah, but the rest of it is it, sweet it's just a little literally a puff of smoke in the back of your mm-hmm. throat it's so nice you know it's funny that you don't like smoke in your whiskeys because you used to be a smoker <laughs> yeah. and i never actually i never actually made that connection until right now yeah, but i never liked I, when i was a smoker a long time ago I never liked walking by somebody smoking. Okay. Like, I never liked, oh, my God, please blow smoke in my face. Yeah, you, it's and, like you don't like other people's farts. Right. Well, yeah. I don't, don't know that I love my own either, but I mean, I, I guess I do. I still like a nice cigar every now and then, but as soon as I'm done with a cigar, yeah, I can't yeah. wait to get the taste of cigar mm-hmm. out of my mouth and mm-hmm. off my fingers. But yeah, and you go home and wash your clothes. And yeah, exactly. But that's Cry why in the shower in the, the corner. The reason I like, right, like crying game. Like, the reason I like a nice, stiff... Ooh. Whiskey. Oh, okay. With whiskey. A, okay. With a cigar, Dick. Uh, you're a dick. So <laughs> that's what I meant. I know, but okay. Not, I mean, you are. Oh, I but see. The um, <laughs> I am. I would say that it's because like I like the way that the whiskey takes the coating of cigar off my tongue while I'm smoking it, so it doesn't get in there. Like, and yeah, you know, well, why do you smoke cigars? Well, there is an enjoyment to it. There is a, mm-hmm. a nicotine rush from it, mm-hmm. and, and there is a, a flavor pairing with a nice cigar and either a single malt American or a scotch or even a, a good high-level bourbon. So what do you get on the palate of this? Um, and I get apples. Like, uh, I get a spicy apple cake is kind of what I get. That might be slightly burnt. <laughs> I get a little leather and, and some oak. Almost like a savory, if you will. Like mm-hmm. almost like I can almost like a salty. Uh-huh. It's not salty. Like it's a bad. Oh but, no! But you know what I mean. Like yeah, it's like a not overly floral or anything like that for me. I don't get cherry or, or anything like that. I get a, a, a very earthy. Yeah, earthy tone to it. Absolutely. Um, the, the nose is very earthy. The taste is very earthy. The tasting notes um, in their marketing materials for the palate: baking spice, mm-hmm. salted pretzel. Interesting. Hints of roasted barley surrounded by a savory smokiness. Well, there we go. And I literally <laughs> never read that. I didn't read that for once. I actually got the damn tasty notes right. <laughs> we did a really good job on that one. <laughs> you especially. The finish says long, warm finish of milk chocolate and sea salt. And I can totally see that. I agree. So I think this episode really gave us a nice perspective on two different groups that really enjoy and benefit from sourcing. The retail marketplace, the liquor stores, the, mm-hmm. the bars that put out their own spirit and also put out barrel picks of existing spirits mm-hmm. and kind of highlight them. And the up and coming distilleries like Lost Lantern who go out, search for the product that they like. And by combining at least six different recipes together, nobody else is going to have this recipe. It's just not possible. Right. That's such an undertaking. Yeah, they're living. They're 
they're know, living the dream. They are living the dream. Yeah. Just traveling around to distillery sounds like a pretty good uh, use of my time. We're so jealous. We I'm so are a little bit of jealous. I'm so jealous. Yeah. So, Before we go, so I have something a little fun. Okay, yeah, yeah. I have a top 10 list, Oh, but we haven't done one in a while. No. I want to preface this by saying that we tasted nearly 100 whiskeys on our podcast. Okay. We featured them. So I went through and counted. 28 of them have been sourced. Oh. So of those 28, I picked mm-hmm. the top 10 most surprising not necessarily good, sourced whiskeys okay. on the Whiskey Tangent Podcast. Okay. So the restrictions were it had to be sourced whiskey, number one. Number two, we had to taste it on air. We couldn't just talk about right, it. Right. And number three, at least one of us had never tasted it before. Right. And um, which leaves out Bullet Rye, Angel's Emmy Rye, mm-hmm. Midwinter, Sagamore, High West, Double Right. So mm-hmm. it kind of eliminates all those. So what's left is number 10, Basil Hayden's Caribbean Rum Rye. So this okay. is a mixture of their stuff. Right. And also stuff from Alberta distillers in Canada. I did not know that they had other stuff in it. Yeah. So so it's a blend. Mash bill was not disclosed. It's 80 proof, four years. Mm-hmm. And we did a short on it. Right. Uh, that was the first time that Siobhan was ever on the podcast. Hi. Oh, I can't believe it's just a year and some changing. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. We like that quite a bit. No. The, the one thing about that, the reason why I said it was surprising, on air, we really liked it. But later, when we had it again, we felt that the finish was really quick and it just dropped off a it cliff was- and you couldn't yeah. put water in it or anything because no, it, it would thin. drink it first drink it in the morning for breakfast <laughs> <laughs> it's a breakfast drink it's a breakfast with yeah number nine widow jane decadence okay so this is their tenure that they source from mgp and sometimes also from kentucky so it's a little weird on the label it says both indiana and kentucky mm-hmm. that mash bill is also not disclosed it's 91 proof it's ages 10 years and we did a short on that this past summer this was surprising because it was so sweet because it actually had maple syrup in it yeah like if that was 55 dollars, i'd always have a bottle in my closet yeah but at what, 80? Yeah, five? 75, 80. Yeah. At 80, I just, ah, there's other whiskeys to buy. Right. The basil Hidden Rum Rye was the breakfast. This is the dessert whiskey. Yeah, right. This is right before bed. <laughs> Number eight, knock, knock, knocking on heaven's door. Double barrel. Mm-hmm. That's uh, sourced from Tennessee, an undisclosed Tennessee probably, uh, distillery. Probably George Dickel. Probably. They did not disclose its mash bill. It's a hundred proof, uh, no age statement. And that was on episode 17 right. with uh, Gabe. Right. My sources tell me that Heaven Hill gets it from George Dickel. Yeah. Yeah. The Cascade well, my, Hollow my, distillery. My massive minions out in the whiskey world feeding me information. <laughs> You're like um, Varys on the <laughs> Game of Thrones. <laughs> number seven, blood oh, back number five. Uh, that was three different bourbons, I think, that finished in Caribbean rum cask. Yep. They did not disclose their sources. The mash bill was at least 51% corn because they were calling it a bourbon. Right. Uh, 98.6 proof because of Blood Oath. Get it? Um, no age statement. And we did a short, and that was one of our first shorts. Coming up, we do Blood Oath pack number six. Yeah. And you'll hear that in two weeks. What's funny about the Blood Oath short, the first one we did, is we, we thought that's how shorts were going to be like nine minutes and we would be called a day. Then we realized that we just can't just shut the fuck up. <laughs> we have to just go on and on and have guests on and make everything a production. So now, like, if we get away with an 18 minute short or 20 minute short, we're like, thank God we got out of there without it being a half an hour. Like, <laughs> How many, I don't know how many not so short shorts we had the last year, but and I'm the biggest I'm the biggest offender. Trust me, I will, I will drag a short out to death. We have stars and animals and <laughs> chimpanzees. <laughs> what? What chimpanzees? What the fuck am I talking well, about? That's chimps on tramp- tramp- chips on trampolines, right? Trapeze artists trapeze, is what I meant. Right. Yeah. You're going for, but I think chimps on trapeze would be even more. Well, that interesting. would be interesting as well. <laughs> <You're>, <laughs> what is happening? Number six. Listen to Scott. Fuck this one up. Jefferson's Reserve, very old, very, very old, hmm, very small, what is it? It's very old, small batch, hmm, very old, very small batch. That's what it is, too very. Something like that. Uh, not the just very small batch, because no, 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 no. have, we have some of that, and it's, it's not that good. No. I got it for Christmas, and yeah. it's not that good, but the very old, very small batch is terrific it comes in that tin they don't disclose where they get their stuff from either right, right. but they do say that they get it from three different places right and i will tell you right now that the bardstown bourbon company claims to give them some so okay. i don't care what they're saying right bardstown bourbon says we give stuff to jefferson so that's <laughs> one of the three right there right we can assume what another one is and i don't know what the other one is. right heaven hill has a massive amount of whiskey and what's surprising about this was at least one of the whiskeys is almost 20 years old mm-hmm. and we fucking loved it there was so much butterscotchy 
thick flavor to it. It was delicious. We did that on episode eight. That was so long ago. We are just babes. Right. Babes in the woods. That was Jeff's first episode. Yeah, it was very good. It was surprisingly good. We were doing it to celebrate July 4th. We thought we'd bring out Jefferson to honor the the writer of the Declaration of Independence. Right. We talked about the founding fathers and their their relationship. Yeah. It was cool. It was a good episode. Check it out. Number five, the weird barrel number one. We actually talked about this a little bit with Billy from Ben Ash in the interview we just did. And you can also hear what we think about it in episode 24. This is an insert because I forgot to do it in real time because I'm a huge dope. Number four, Barrel Dovetail. One of the best whiskeys we've ever tasted on the podcast, I have to say. This is sourced from MGP and an undisclosed Tennessee right. distillery. And it's 80 bucks, which sounds like way, way overpriced for a source whiskey. Well, I'm going to tell you, you're wrong. <laughs> and another reason, like it's 123.8 proof. You just so don't good. need a lot no. to, you know, get your drink on. So good. Number three, Whistle Pig Big Big Rye. And the reason why this was surprising was because we liked it better than the $115 12-year rye we did. And from no, Whistle Pig. And if you liked the 12-year better, that's great. No offense to you or Whistle Pig, but the flavor profile of the piggyback appealed to us more. So yeah. you want to, you know, call us scoundrels or whatever and slap us with your with your gauntlet. Ooh. That's fine. I challenge you to a duel, sir. <laughs> but the reality is... Um, <laughs> That the twelve year the proof is kind of down. It's like in yeah, the eighties. The proof is lower. And the eighty six, I and think since it was. The piggyback's made for mixing. It's got a little bit more proof to yeah, it. Ninety two or something. We a, have some. It's just a wait, I want some. Get it out. I want to have a splash right now. I didn't know we had that. So it's age six years. It's a hundred percent rye. And it's ninety six point five six proof. Right. It's still punched to it. And um And you know, th- what's interesting is about they sourced this from the same Alberta distillers that the Basil Hayden rum rye got part of their whiskey from. This is 100% oh, okay. Canadian rye. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's good, isn't it? So Talk about good. floral. Now, this is, the piggyback has a tremendous floral aftertaste. Mm-hmm. It's just spectacular. Especially it, when it was made as a mixer. Like, yeah. I think, oh, it's a mixer. Like, what is it, Johnny Walker Red? No, not at all. It's delicious on its own. Yeah, that's why I put it up at number three. So we have two more. Number two, James E. Pepper 1776 bourbon. <laughs> <laughs> the reason why it's surprising is how much we hated it. Mm-hmm. We hated it we did it in episode 27 so if you want to hear us hate on a whiskey (laughs) go back and listen to it hated it our guests hated it i tried to make cocktails with it and then i poured probably a third of a bottle down the drain i just couldn't drink it and i didn't have any brass to clean up or whatever else i could have used it for like it was just foul (laughs) i've never poured a third of a bottle of whiskey away in my life i I know not it was fucking terrible it's mash bill is 57 percent corn 39 percent rye and four percent malted barley we think this is shared from mgp in bardstown as we said before Mm -hmm. its age was only three years i mean we've had younger expressions though that tasted better than that it was the offensive taste of it it just tasted spoiled almost yeah it it was bad so uh, you may wonder what could be more surprising than that yeah what was that number one spirits of the apocalypse oh yeah and the reason why that was so surprising the opposite how much we loved it yeah the yeah. lowest expectations ever. It's ever. from The Walking Dead. Yeah, it's like, a gimmick whiskey. Right, exactly. But I learned it's sourced from Heaven Hill. Okay. 78% corn, 10% rye, 12% malted barley, 94 proof, aged at least four years. And we did it on one of our favorite shorts, the Halloween short. The Halloween short. If you, if you have never heard our Halloween short, you have to go back and listen to it. It's not long, and it's got more laughs per minute than anything we've ever done on here. I listen it's to rapid it. Rapid fire. I listen to it at least once every six months to cheer myself up. It's but, our favorite thing we've done. Anyway, yeah. So that's it. Um, we yeah. hope you enjoyed our three-part whiskumentary this year on sourcing. We'll have another topic next year in January, which we were already thinking about. What do you, What else you got? Well, I just want to thank everybody who helped us out with this. I want to thank MGP and, and Justin King for coming on. I want to thank uh, Billy and Rich at Benash for always being supportive. Mm-hmm. And I want to thank the uh, Lost Lantern crew, uh, Nora and Adam, for coming on. And Scott for all his editing. <laughs> <laughs> that second part was that, a bear. <laughs> that makes me sound crisp. There's just so many thoughts I have on sourcing, and I'm glad that we were able to do this. We were talking about it for over a year. Yeah, yeah. Next Thursday we'll be off. Yep. But the week after that, tune in for our regular programming. Yep. Uh, so for the Whiskey Tangent Podcast, I'm Ed. I'm Scott. Cheers, everybody. Later.
Thank you.